Hi! Welcome to the tutorial video for the Ultimate Polymer Clay Craft Kit from Blushery. My name is Brooke, I'm the owner of the business, and I am going to walk you through it. So I've got a kit in front of me right now, it should be exactly the same as what you have. Let's open it up and see what's inside. So here's some of the items that we've got. You may, uh, should have a freebie. We have a packet of baby wipes, keeping our space clean, keeping our hands clean. You have a polymer clay press. You have a packet of shape cutters. Here we go. You have a huge packet of Sculpey Clay Primo and Souffle. This is excellent quality clay. A ceramic tile. In this box here, the little one, the box itself is a tool, but we'll talk about that more later. You have an oven thermometer for baking, some packets of string and clasps for your lanyards and your keychains, hair clips, fridge magnets, some glitter, two pairs of cute pink pliers, two different kinds of glue, and I will explain which glue is for which project later on. Earring findings. Scrap clay. Scrap clay is for if you're not feeling totally confident, you wanna try something before moving on to the really beautiful colors. This is what scrap clay is for. An acrylic roller. A very, very sharp tissue blade a nail file, which we use in place of sandpaper because I find it easier, a hand drill, a toothbrush, this just adds texture, a dotting tool, again, just a fun tool for texture, and this is your hole maker tool. Um, it's got two parts, it's got the tube and the plunger, and we will talk about that more later. So that is everything that's in the kit. The way that this tutorial video works is we are going to start with earring making fully from start to finish. A lot of the prints and patterns and textures that I teach in the earring making portion can be used later on in your beads and your hair clips and your magnets. So even if you don't maybe want to start with earrings, I would recommend watching that section of the tutorial anyway. If you have the time, watch the whole thing from start to finish. You should be able to jump ahead later on to keychains, lanyards, hair clips, fridge magnets. But the majority of the information is in the largest section, the earring making section. So let's get into it. Okay, I'm all set up here, ready to go for earring making. So I have my polymer clay press set up, secured to the table, it's got its crank. Now, full disclosure, I did not want to open up a brand new polymer clay press. I thought I would rather leave that for a customer. So this one is one that I've had for years and actually it's a pasta machine. So if you hear people talking about pasta machine or clay press, they are really, they're identical products. This just has some extra things that cut noodles and obviously we don't, we don't use that. We just use this section here. Make sure it's on the thickest setting it can obviously, it can go quite thin, which may come in handy, but for conditioning the clay and color mixing, you're gonna want it to be on the thickest setting. I also did not open my brand new Sculpey pack. Again, let's leave that for the customers, but I'm just using some clay that I had lying around. So, conditioning the clay. You may find that some of these blocks of clay are really quite firm and kind of crumbly, and you know, as you break them apart, it's, um, it needs some softening. Conditioning, softening, same thing. So here's how you do it. This machine clicks a little bit, so I will um, stop talking while it makes its noise. Now, number one rule with clay conditioning and the clay press is to fold the clay and put the fold at the bottom. We do not want to trap air bubbles in the clay, so the fold goes first and it pushes the air up and out. If you put your fold at the top, it's going to trap air bubbles inside the clay. You'll bake it, the air will expand, and you'll get like lumps. So always, always, always put the fold at the bottom. When you have bigger blocks of clay, to speed this process up, you can fold in three. One, two, three, 
one, two, three layers like that. And always putting your outside edges in will also speed this process up. Let's talk about color mixing. In this beautiful pack of colors, these are quite vibrant, dark colors. There are no pastels really, which is why I'm gonna create some. You have three beautiful whites in here to mix with the more vibrant colors. So this one was quite a lot of white and just a touch of red to make this beautiful soft pink. This one is a little bit of white. It's about half, half white and red. So this is gonna make a darker pink. Let's see how it turns out. So understanding just some very basic color theory will help you a lot. So just look on Google and you will find lots of kind of charts. It doesn't have to be an exact science. You can just go off a of very, very basic color, color recipes and stuff like that. Okay, what we're gonna do now is some textures and prints. We're gonna start with the marble print. And again, I'm kind of following along with the instruction sheet that is included in your pack. So to create a marble print, we need at least two colors. You can do, you know, there's no limit. Lots of colors is fine too. Start by rolling them into snakes or sausages or cylinders, whatever you want to call them. It doesn't have to be neat. They're all getting mixed up together anyway. So I've got two here. I'm going to put them together and I'm going to twist. Basically, we're going for lots of lines, lots of stripes. Fold it in half and twist it some more. Squish it in a bit. More twisting. I think I untwisted that actually. You can roll it into a ball just to get these colors kind of facing different directions. Now, if I roll this back into a cylinder shape, see how it's much more stripy. So when you think you've got a decent amount of stripes in your marble, roll it into a ball. This will show you, this was going to give you an idea of what it's going to look like when it's flat. So that's pretty good. If you want these colors to be blended a little bit more, not so contrasting stripes, you can squeeze it and soften it with your fingers like this. I'm folding it, squeezing it, fold it, squeeze, fold squeeze. You can actually have some control over this. Like, I don't like the way this looks. I'm going to push it in and I'm going to fold the clay over. It disappears. All right, that's pretty good. So then, whoopsies, once you're happy with it, have a look at the part you like best. I don't really like that side, but I do like this side. Make sure that's facing up. I'm going to run it through my press and we'll roll it flat. There we go. Let's do polka dots now. We'll do some polka dots over here. So polka dots are very simple. Again, we're starting with a cylinder shape. Very thin this time though. So the tissue blade comes in handy here to chop off little tiny bits of your snake. You can make them all very even. You could do some big and some small. Maybe I'll do some big and some small. It, it might stick to the blade, which is actually very convenient on keeping them all together. Take your little shapes and roll them into a ball. Stick them down. Now, you can see how these are raised up slightly. You might like that. That's a pretty cool effect. Or if you want to roll it flat, you can either put it through your clay press again, or you can use the roller to just gently soften them. When you're using your roller, just make sure that you're not pushing too hard, that it's actually flattening your slab. You only just want to bring this second layer down to the first layer. You're not trying to make it any thinner than it already is. So that is polka dots. Let's do what I call sprinkles. I'm gonna do it on this. 
So sprinkles is actually the same process as the polka dots. It's just that I'm not going to, I'm not going to um, roll these cylinders into balls. I'm gonna leave them as they are, like a sprinkle. Put them on the clay kind of randomly. Now, something that looks very good in earring making is to do a print with multiple colors and then a texture over top of that print. So the dotting tool included in your kit, it's the stick with different sized metal balls on the end. It's just to create indents. So you could do something like putting polka dots over top of your sprinkles. Now, these don't really look like much until there's a shape cut out of them, but once I do cut out a shape, they're gonna look like gorgeous earrings. The last one that we're gonna do is a, I call it a messy cow print, or, and then I'm gonna turn it into a leopard print. To create a very messy print, which again, we're going in the same order that is on your instruction sheets, I'm going to take a secondary color and stretch it as thin as I possibly can. Look at that, it's like paper thin. So thin that we can rip shapes off and they have like a jagged edge. Now this looks very cool on its own. We can make it look even cooler by doing the same thing again, but slightly smaller. And we're gonna put it in the center of those orange shapes. And it is hard to visualize this being a leopard print, but if it was in your classic like beige background, black outlines and brown centers, that this is a leopard print. So, so these are just for some very basic, easy prints that you can do. Let's cut some shapes out and you will see how cool they look. When we're cutting out shapes, make sure you press down with the palm of your hand I like to give it a little wiggle as well, just a little bit. Also something the tissue blade comes in handy for is scraping off your shapes off the tile. They will stick to the tile. Sometimes that comes in very handy, um, but you can, if you try to pick it up with your fingers, you may distort the shape. The blade comes in handy for that. You can come this way, you can go this way, you can go side by side. It's really whatever is most comfortable for you but a quick zigzag motion, as flat as you can get the blade to the tile, will, it's, it's almost using it like a spatula. Like so, there we go. So, that's a pretty cool earring shape, if I do say so myself. The next thing to do is to flatten out the edges of the shape. You shouldn't have too rough edges because these metal cutters have nice sharp edges. You find it's a little bit more rough if you're using a plastic shape cutter, but if you do have any rough edges, just tap them down with your finger very gently. And that is ready to go. Let's cut out some more shapes. If you want to add glitter to your polymer clay, here's how to do it. It gets stuck onto the raw clay. I usually just dip my finger into the glitter pot and push it on the clay so that it does, doesn't go everywhere. I usually recommend matching the glitter color to the clay color. So for example, I would put this teal on the teal colored clay. Of course, you can do whatever you want to do and your kit should include a white glitter and the white glitter just looks fantastic on all colors, which is why we have included it in the kit. So I will put a little bit of glitter on one of my circles here. Just dipping my finger in and push on the clay. Cover the whole thing. It will spill over the edges a little. You can also kind of swirl it around, brush it around. You do want to push down a little bit to stick it. The good thing about the white glitter is you can still see what's underneath, but now it has a nice shiny glittery finish. So remember when you are making your earring shapes to put a little bit of thought into what's gonna connect with what. 
I have just quickly done up some topper pieces for my heart and a topper piece for my hexagon. These can be connected like this, so you glue a stud onto the backs of these. You put holes here and here to connect the two shapes together with a jump ring. And then we also have these beautiful connector pieces which can be thrown in the mix as well. Maybe I could put the hexagon here and then I would have a jump ring connecting this and this. Or maybe you wanna just dangle a charm on top of your polymer clay piece like this, which would be done these pieces are incorporated after baking, but you have to put some thought into what you're making before you bake it so that you're, you know, the most successful. So let's talk about baking. You have a cardboard box like this. The cardboard box itself is a baking tool. Cardboard is going to protect the clay from the direct heat of the oven, blasting down on the top and potentially burning it. So that's why we bake and we insulate the clay with cardboard. You might have a piece of parchment paper. Parchment paper is good if you're not gonna bake your pieces immediately. If you are gonna bake your pieces immediately, it's okay to put them directly on the cardboard. But just the thing about the parchment paper is it saves the cardboard from sucking a bit of moisture out of the clay. So if you were gonna bake your pieces in a few hours or even if you wanted to leave them sitting for a few days definitely use your parchment paper but i will bake these straight away so i'm just putting it directly on the cardboard now something to really spend the time doing here is to make sure your pieces are flat when i pick my piece up off the tile it bends a bit and when i put it in the box its sides are up like that it's not flat it's not going to flatten out in the oven. It's gonna stay like that. So it is really worth spending the time making sure that your pieces are flat. That's just gonna give you a really professional look. When this goes in the oven, it gets closed, but with still a little gap for airflow. I like to kind of balance the this on the lip so it doesn't close. Um, it depends on your box. It might want to pop open or it might want to slip closed. So do what you have to do to close it with a little gap for airflow. Your oven thermometer also goes in the oven on the same rack as the box. So the oven thermometer is gonna be sitting inside the oven on the same shelf as your clay. So you can look and you can see exactly the temperature inside. Remember that we're aiming for 130 degrees Celsius this oven thermometer has Fahrenheit and Celsius, so you gotta make sure you're looking at the inside numbers, not the outside numbers. The baking time and temperature is written down in your instruction sheet. There is a little teeny tiny measuring tape in there if you are unsure how to bake, but the minimum baking time, no matter how thick or thin your pieces are, is 30 minutes. 30 minutes minimum, or if you've done very, very thick pieces or very 3D pieces, that are you know, quite big and quite heavy, then maybe you'd bake for 45 minutes, maybe you'd bake for an hour um, or longer if you've made something um, huge. <laughs> okay, here's my pieces out of the oven, fully cooled. Now, polymer clay does have a slight flexibility to it. So when you take it out of the oven, you will notice it does bend a little bit. This is perfectly cooked. It should have a slight bend and a slight flexibility to it. That is normal. Some brands have more flexibility than others, so don't test it out for fun because you might say, oh, this is cool, it bends, and then it'll snap. So just know that it should be slightly bendy, but you don't have to see how far it'll bend before it breaks. Of course, you could do that. If you're curious, I would recommend using your scrap clay. So we are going to sand some of these now, if necessary. Um, I mean, I've been making polymer clay earrings for many years, so I don't really see any any bits, any imperfections that I want to sand off. But if you have those rough edges, using the nail file. Use the finer side. Hold your piece, you know, close to where you're sanding. You don't want to hold it over here and sand over here because then it will potentially break. Hold it close to. There's a tiny little seam there. I might sand that off just very gently. I like to kind of go down and around. 
But again, it depends. You, to get into those corners, you, you need to go kind of an up and down motion like that. This is why the nail file is good because it's so good to get into corners. That's why I prefer to use a nail file over sandpaper, but try some different things and see what works for you. So sandpaper will leave, it will scratch up the back. I'll show you on this one. Here's the front and here's the back. If I sand this, that kind of white scuff is not going to go away. So even if you, you know, used a, a baby wipe to clean it, it kind of looks like the white scuff mark has disappeared, but it will come back. So that's why we don't sand the front. Never sand the front, unless your piece is pure white, then you can get away with it. But generally, we just sand the edges, maybe the backs if you're okay with the scuffing on the back. Um, and that sanding, it's very, very simple. I would recommend uh, wearing a mask when you're sanding so that you're not breathing in the dust. Safety first, or you could do it outside. The polymer clay dust, it, you can't really see it, but it is there and it'll float up and it'll get on you. You'll breathe it in and it'll settle on all your furniture. So those are my tips for sanding. Let's get into drilling. So drilling, this is the hand drill. This little guy here, which includes a little drill bit, is how to get your holes in. So you're obviously going to go through the clay all the way. You don't want to tap onto the tile, so a bit of cardboard or a bit of wood, something that it's okay for the drill bit to go into, is going to be needed. Uh, some people like to mark their clay before they drill. It's up to you. Obviously, we have to think about what we're doing with our shapes. As I had out before, I had some of these connector shapes out. So maybe I might put a gold leaf on the front of this. I think that looks quite nice. So I'm really only gonna need one hole. So let's start with this one. Holding the drill bit right side up, holding firmly so that we know it's in the right spot. Then put your hand up and over and start twisting. You don't want to push too hard. You want to let the drill bit do the work. You're not pushing really hard. You're just twisting. That's all. And you might feel it pop through. Yes. Like that. You might have to kind of pull and twist. There we go. That's a beautiful little hole. Now, sometimes cracking can happen, especially with some um, brands of clay. A crack can happen when you're drilling, drilling your hole, it may break. I would recommend using your scrap clay or a little bit of, of this clay to bake a test piece and just drill, 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 lots of holes so that you get the hang of it. And there is a little bit of a, um, a skill. You need to have a kind of a light touch when you're drilling. So that is drilled. Make sure you match your pieces up first, know what's going to connect, know where holes need to go in all your pieces before you drill so that they fit together nicely when it comes time to assemble. I'm going to keep drilling. Now that we have holes, we can assemble. Remember that jump rings open side to side, and remember that using two pairs of pliers is easier than using one. Now, here is a tip with the hook earring findings. If we attach the clay to the hook with one jump ring, the earring is going to hang sideways like this. It will hang sideways on your face. Really, we want them facing like this. So in order to do that, we just get our pliers and we grab this whole entire loop and twist it 90 degrees. This is written down in your instruction sheet, so make sure you pay attention to that section. This is going to ensure the earring sits a little bit better on your ear, although for some designs it may not matter, and some designs uh, you may want hanging in one direction and, and others in the other direction. Your earring display cards will make your earrings look great for gifting or selling. When it comes time to apply your glue, remember that it's a very slow drying glue. Wait 24 hours before you wear your earrings and also wait 24 hours before you put those earrings on their earring cards. 
All right, let's talk hair clips. So you should have in your pack three hair clips. Um, may not be these sizes exactly, but you'll have a three assorted hair clips. What I like to do is to add small shapes to the hair clips, as you will see in your instruction packet. There's a good example of that. Um, it's very, very simple and easy to do. I'll show you a very quick example, and we're not gonna talk about textures, prints, glitter, that kind of thing in this section because that is covered in the earring making section. So if you've jumped ahead, I would recommend going back to the earring making section where we talk about uh, the basics like conditioning your clay, creating some fun prints and patterns which can be done on any, um, well, earring, bead, hair clip, fridge magnet, anything. So just creating shapes and you can do these in different colors. You can do them in all the same color, whatever you want to do. Now these can be, it depends, it depends. You can put them actually on your hair clip. It depends on the shape. You could put them on the hair clip and you can bake the whole hair clip with its clay on top of it in the oven if that works for you. The metal hair clip, it's just metal. It can go in the oven, no problem. Or you can bake these flat to then be glued. You can bake them as individual pieces and then glue them one by one, or you can join them all up together in a strip like this. If you do it like this way, you've got a little bit more security. If we join these shapes together pre-baking, it'll be stronger on the hair clip overall. So I'm gonna give you a tip on how to do that. The way I wanna join it is I wanna join it on the back, not the front. I want the front to look you know, as good as, as good as it does right now. So I'm gonna flip it. It's gonna just stick to the blade a little bit. And I'm just touching these shapes together a little bit. Not too much, there we go. Now the dotting tool can be used for this process and basically I'm just trying to push the clay together to kind of join up the seams there just a little bit. But that's gonna make a huge difference in the strength of the hair clip. Just like that and obviously that's going on the back side so we won't see it. So again, it's just a matter of, <laughs> and this, this bit is tricky, getting your clay up off the tile, I know. It is a tricky bit, it takes a bit of practice. And this will go into the box flat for baking to be glued onto the hair clip. So once this is baked and cooled down, then we talk about glue. We are using the E6000 glue. This is a very slow drying glue, and so there's no rush. Put a bit of glue don't overdo it, you know, you don't want it to be oozing everywhere. A little bit of glue on the surface of your hair clip. Um, you know, or if it's a thinner one like this, maybe using a cotton tip or something to just apply the glue to the metal. Very slowly again, don't rush, apply your shape, and then you're going to want to hold that clay on the hair clip for quite a while while we let that glue um, harden just a little bit. They glue takes 24 hours to fully set. So do not wear your hair clips for 24 hours. Just let the glue do its thing and then you can wear them. All right, let's talk beads. So again, as I said in the previous section about hair clips, a lot of the basics are in the earring making section. The things that you can do on a bead are the same things that you can do on an earring. To a bead, I can add polka dots, I can add stripes, I can add leopard print, I can add texture with the dotting tool. Um, there's, It's just whether you roll it flat like an earring or a hair clip, or whether you roll it in the palm of your hands on a bead. So jump over, if you haven't already, jump back over to the earring making section for the very basics. But here is how to create a bead shape. So a little bit of clay, it's nicely conditioned. The tricky part about bead making is not, um, is making beads that are the right size. If your bead is too big, this one that I've got here is quite a big bead. The only way to know is to put it in the palm of your hand. That, that is a very, very chunky bead. 
If your bead is too big, it's more likely going to crack in the oven. And that is tiny, tiny little pockets of air. Again, we do our best to add air bubbles in when we're conditioning, but tiny little pockets of air that expand and then the bead just cracks. That's not, that doesn't mean you have to throw your bead away. Your bead is not going to shatter if it cracks, but it obviously looks better if it's not cracked. So this is a bit big, I might take a little bit off. Now, when you roll your ball flat and you have lines in it like this, little little bits where it's not smoothing out you can roll it in your hands like this all day and they may not disappear so there it is if you have those stubborn lines push them in with the with the thumb or with the finger push them in not worrying about the round shape of your bead but just pushing hard to flatten out those seams then roll your bead shape so that's a perfect size I personally like the abacus bead shape, which is round, slightly flattened. When you add a hole in your bead, it slightly flattens anyway, and so that's why I like to just create that shape to start with. I like to flatten half of it, lift it up, flip it, and flatten the other side, just obviously so it's even. Now, if you want to add prints to your bead. You would do that before. You would do that when it's in its round shape. Whack on some polka dots, whack on some stripes, roll it. If you were adding texture, you would do that after you poke your hole in the bead. So let me show you how to poke a hole. Bead is a nice shape. This is called a hole maker or a plunger. The metal tube is what creates the hole. The wooden skewer with the bit on the end is what pushes out the clay that is gonna get stuck in the tube. So, find the center, twisting and pushing at the same time. Really make sure you've gone all the way through and you can feel the metal on the tile. Lift up the whole bead on the stick. I also like to just push it out a little bit. See how it's just come through? That's just gonna make sure that your hole isn't smaller on this end and bigger on this end. Now, when you're adding textures, it's very convenient to have your bead on the tube because then you're not touching it. You're not getting fingerprints on it. You're not gonna distort the shape. And you can add textures like so. And obviously you can be totally creative and do whatever you wanna do. Now, getting the bead off the tube is also something that just takes practice and you just have to get a feel for it. I like to get as much surface area of the bead. If you grab two points, those two points are gonna squish. If I grab four points, each one is, is it's a more evenly spread um, distribution. So twisting, twisting, there we go. Beautiful bead. So these get baked in the oven and you've got baking instructions on your sheet. As I said in the very first section on earring making, the cardboard box is your baking tool. Put the beads inside the cardboard box there's a measuring tape so you can measure your bead and only measuring you don't have to measure this whole thing because there's a hole in the center so you really only measure half or you might measure tall if it's taller than wider you measure that but a good rule of thumb is to bake your beads for about an hour if they're really bigger beads maybe up to an hour and a half or if they're teeny tiny beads maybe 30 minutes so you just give give it a little measure with the measuring tape and off you go remember to um, put your oven thermometer inside the oven and keep an eye on that temperature. If your temperature accidentally goes over, again, more likelihood of cracks. Once your beads are baked and cooled down, we'll talk about assembling them into keychains and lanyards. All right, let's talk about assembling a keychain. My beads have been baked, they've come out of the oven, and they are fully cooled down. Don't work with them when they are still hot. So. In your pack, you will have long cords and you will have short cords. Long cords are for lanyards or maybe necklaces. Short cords are perfect length for a keychain. You can also use either of the clasps, big or small. The big one will actually hold keys on it. The small one won't, but it's more of like a bag tag. It will clip your keychain onto something. So have a think about which one you wanna use. And you can also thread the cord either through the big ring like this or through the little ring 
like this. There is no right or wrong answer, just do whatever you like the best. So thread it through, put your cord ends together, and then we put both cords through the beads. Because the cord is stretchy elastic, sometimes you have to push it through the holes. It's not gonna slide really super easily, but because it is stretchy, you will be able to get it on there. Right, so beads on the string like that. Simply tie a knot at the bottom. Trim the excess. So I would just take my scissors and cut those to the length I want, really short or maybe a little bit longer or something in the middle. What you can also do is singe the ends of the cord with a flame. Right here on the end, just a little touch with a flame, very carefully obviously, make sure an adult is doing that, um, will stop the material from fraying on you. And that is a keychain. All right, we're gonna make a lanyard now. So I have a nice long cord, thread it through. Again, you can use either the big clasp or the small clasp for a lanyard. It's just how much do you wanna hold on the lanyard? Put the cord ends together and slide your beads on. Well, just like that. Now, there is no reason why we need a knot here because the cord and the size of the holes in the bead is just right. So your beads will not go anywhere. They'll stay down here. All we have to do is attach our plastic safety breakaway clasps, which are these here. They might come already stuck together or they might come apart. If you need to undo it, just kind of break it, break it like this, there you go. You should have an innie and an outie piece. They should not be identical, two different pieces. Put them on each cord. And then tie knots at the very ends. Just like so. So we have knots at the very tips. If you need to trim these, you can. Again, I would singe the end of the cord with a flame to stop it from fraying. I also recommend using the super glue that's included in your kit to put a bit of glue on the knot to really keep it strong. Because remember, this is elastic. If we pull the clasp really, really hard, it will potentially stretch and squish out of its hole. So if we coat the whole entire knot in a little bit of super glue, this knot will become rock hard and then your safety clasps aren't going anywhere. Alrighty, we're moving on to fridge magnets. So in your pack, you have a pack of six little magnets here. Again, one more time, all of the basics, polka dots, stripes, and all the fun textures and prints are at the beginning in the earring section, so jump back over. I have got a beautiful marble clay here, and I'm gonna flatten that out, and I'm gonna show you kind of, um, it's like a round, flat, shape. So when we are creating fridge magnets, different to earrings, the it's the reverse. What's on the tile is actually going to be the front, opposite to an earring where the face up, this is face down. So I'm just flattening out my ball and this is a kind of a bigger um, shape than when I was bead making. You could use the roller to help, but we do not want this to be as thin as an earring piece. Um, fridge magnets, you know, they can sometimes fall off the fridge. You want it to be a nice thick bit of clay, not too thin. So I'm just kind of rotating this as I go so it's nice and even. Now this shape as it is, is has nice smooth rounded edges, which I love. So I like this shape. I think that's a great fridge magnet shape. Something that is good to do if possible, if your piece is flat on the front, and if you can use the magnet to create an indent where the magnet is going to sit later, that's gonna make your magnet just a little bit more secure because it's gonna be snug in there and it's gonna have a little nest to sit in. But that's not totally necessary. As I might show you in the next example, um, I'll just bake that one flat. But this one, 
that's done. So that will get baked upside down because I wanna make sure that this little indent that I've created doesn't get distorted. Once the clay is baked and if the magnet doesn't fit in there, there and you try to force it, you know, it could break. So I would bake that upside down just like that. Now, you could use the shape cutters as well in your fridge magnet making, but a normal slab of clay run through the polymer clay press is a little bit too thin, it'll be a little bit too delicate, so I would recommend folding it in half. Careful you don't trap any air bubbles in there, so that's why I press on the seam first and push the air out. So just to join layer one and layer two, just give it a little roll, but don't you don't want to flatten it too much. We want this to be double thickness than an earring. And you know, I might make uh, make sure that your shape actually fits onto the magnet. I might make some little flowers. Something like that. Now because this shape is not round, it's also it didn't start off thick. I cannot imprint a magnet into it without distorting that shape. If I try to do that, the shape will just kind of, it'll go all funky. So this shape can just be baked exactly as is, right side up, just baked and then glued after baking. So this kind of will look like that. Just a bit of glue, that's it, simple, easy. You can also do 3D designs. If you want to try sculpting, try sculpting miniatures. You can make miniature food. You can make miniature animals. Really working um, in your sculpting, which I don't um, teach in any sort of workshops or DIY kits, but if you wanted to attempt something like that, there's lots of great YouTube videos. And if that's the case, I would probably assume that they're going to be baked right side up, flat back for the magnet to be glued on later. So again, baking instructions for these, they're gonna go inside the cardboard box. These would bake for about 45 minutes, but again, measure if you're unsure. Minimum baking time is 30 minutes. Once they are fully cooled, you're gonna use, again, your E6000 glue, slow drying glue. Don't use too much, just a tiny little dollop. You don't want it to ooze everywhere. A little bit of glue and Again, wait 24 hours for the glue to fully dry before you hang these up on the fridge. You don't want the, you know, the magnet to stay stuck on the fridge and for the polymer clay piece to slowly come unstuck if you put it on the fridge too quickly. Okay, that's it. That's the end of the tutorial video. I know it was a super long one, but I hope that you found it helpful and I hope that you feel ready and inspired to jump into your crafting. So whether you're making your earrings or your hair clips or your magnets or your beads, if you have any questions, let me know. I will do my best to answer any messages that you might send me on Instagram or Facebook or through my website. Remember, you can also jump on Pinterest or YouTube and find all sorts of videos. You can be very specific with your searches. You might search for, you know, a certain type of finish or a certain type of texture that you want to try. Um, there's so many helpful resources out there. So. I hope you have fun making. Go for it. <laughs>